The questions you always had. The answers you were never given. The place to seek the truth. Welcome to Veritas. The theory of multidimensional reality is a unified field theory that scientists have been trying to find and develop for the past 100 years. Are we living in a matrix? In a digital reality? If your government knew that an extinction level event was approaching, would they tell you? Are the Georgia Guidestones, COVID-19, health passports, Agenda 2030, microchipping, AI, etc., pieces of a more sinister agenda to intentionally depopulate Earth, exercise better control, and serve a few who might be left behind? If you want to know, stay with me. And now, here's your host, Mel Hostelrick. Douglas Vogt is the author of many books, including God's Day of Judgment, The Real Cause of Global Warming, The Theory of a Multidimensional Reality, Creation of the Hebrew Alphabet, and many others. You can find him at dieholdfoundation.com and on his YouTube channel, The Die Hold Foundation. Douglas joins us directly from Jacksonville, Florida. Hello, Douglas, and welcome to Veritas. Hi, how's Arizona? Very cold, snowing in the last couple of days, but now finally the clouds have cracked and we have some sun coming out, which is very untraditional for this part of the world. Well, it's 77 degrees out now <laughs> here in Florida. So, but we have clouds. I think it came, the, the stuff came from the Gulf of Mexico. Excellent. Well, Doug, you have been very, very recommended by some of our listeners and you and I have been talking for the past couple of weeks, and I'm fascinated by what you're about to tell us tonight. The poll reversal, the Nova, and all the things that you have learned. Why don't we begin, first of all, because I didn't read a bio. I wanted you to tell us, who is Douglas B. Vogt? Uh, it's pretty simple. Um, I'm 73. I'm a class of 65. And uh, my first major was in geology. Um, played the violin for nine years, though, and uh, I think that connected my right and left brain. So I think kind of three-dimensionally. Uh, I uh, will switch over and because the oil industry wasn't paying, uh, hiring any geologists, so I switched over to accounting. So I was an accountant for a number of years. But when I graduated college in, in June of 70, I uh, continued studying uh, what I really love, which is the earth sciences. And the first book I did was called Reality Revealed, The Theory of Multidimensional Reality. It's a mouthful, and it's about a 450-page book. But that's where I present the first ideas of a uh, information theory of existence. The reason why I uh, leapfrogged almost everybody else in some of these fields is because of this information theory of existence. What we are taught in school is a matter-oriented theory of existence. Most of you, if not all of you, do not know where we got this from and why. But the reason is Aristotle. And none of you know who really Aristotle was, or the, if there was an Aristotle. But there actually was eight authors to Aristotle, to write works of Aristotle. The only one who mentions an Aristotle, who is a Greek author, not a Roman writing in Greek, only mentions him in half of a sentence as an admiral in Alexander the Great's Navy. That's it. Uh, and after that, um, if you see video series 12, part one, it explains the whole thing. The entire chain of custody of the, of the works of Aristotle It was a library that came, contained his works besides others. And I went to Rome via General Lucullius and then Cicero started writing some of it, and then the Calpurnius Pisos after them took it over. There's a reason why, and that's in part two, but that's the reason why we have this matter theory of existence. There was another theory of existence out there, very much of a Jewish idea. It shows up in Plato in his cave analogy, but there was two ways of looking at the universe. Uh, unfortunately, uh, all of our great scientists, including all of us too, us laymen, we were taught this matter theory of existence. We look at everything as being the result of matter, even what light is. 
And, and that's the problem. That's why they could never figure out what causes the ice age and geomagnetic reversals. It's because you can't find an explanation that explains all the phenomena that go on during this thing. Uh, you cannot find it within the creation, you know, as in our reality. You have to realize it is a clock cycle that runs through time. I first knew of the clock cycle, but I didn't know the exact number of years when I first wrote the first book. There was enough things in the mythologies and also in the, the geology journals that there was repeated reversals in ice ages. And they did at that time, we didn't know how many exactly how many years. We knew it was about 12,000 years. In 1989, I, I, I found an article by an astronomer called Bach, and it's called Bach Globulars. And it was like 450 of these, basically a big dust shell around a star or a group of stars, and about from 11,000 to about 14,000 light years from the Earth. That's an estimate. And it was all around the Earth. I said, wait a minute. Maybe when a star novas, it throws off a, its dust shell, its matter shell, and we don't see it for a while, for maybe a, even a thousand years. So... I'm, I went to the University of Washington Library, and there was a, some very good books. Uh, it was an astronomy uh, library, um, math uh, and engineering library. And um, Sky and Telescope 2000 Survey had a great database, and I basically wrote down the database of all known stars, open clusters, and globular clusters in our galaxy. And lo and behold, I found six blank periods in space. Four of the six were actually 12,068 light years apart. That's the clock cycle. When I found that, I basically had destroyed this matter theory of existence. I had proven there was a clock cycle that runs through time. You cannot have a clock cycle unless the universe is the product of a synchronous system. Got it? The next thing that proves that the universe is the product of information is a simple experiment you can do it with less than a hundred dollars worth of electronic parts, and it's called the the phantom leaf effect in Corellian photography. The critics immediately wind up saying, "Well, the leaf must have been on the plate beforehand, therefore you have that residue." But that wasn't the case. I actually knew Thelma Moss from UCLA, and when I was living in Los Angeles at the time, and she did a lot of experiments there. And it's a genuine thing. It only shows it for the first few seconds after you cut the tip of the leaf off and you photograph it in, in a dark room between two plates, a canon or an athrod, you, pace, you, you pass a high voltage, high frequency through the plates. And if you hit the right frequency, you actually see the missing part of the leaf that you cut off. And that's the phantom. The only way that phantom could exist is that what we call the conscious part of the, the leaf, conscious in quotes, uh, to show up as bubbles of light is if the information is being still being transmitted to those coordinates in time and space. Hence, you've got another dimension. You have information that makes up living things and matter coming from another dimension and is created this way. Those two simple experiments or dis discovery and experiment prove that the universe is the product of information. After that, I found more. When I did... Uh, my 2007 book, God's Day of Judgment, The Real Cause of Global Warming, in Chapter 8, has over 400 references from the journal Science, Nature, Geology, and a bunch of others. And it clearly shows a 12,068 year or a 12,000 year cycle. Now, the reason why a ice age happens immediately after a reversal is because what happens at the reversal is the part that's scary. Uh, and in the video series four on YouTube, on, you, you search for Die Hole Foundation, that's D-I-E-H-O-L-D Foundation, you'll actually uh, see all the videos. There's about like 50 some odd videos out there now. But in series four is all the proof you need it's some of the stuff that's in the book. Obviously, you can't put all the information that's in the book on a, on a half hour to an hour video, but it's all there with all the references, too. And what I found is what happens is during the time of the clock cycle, this 12,068-year cycle, our sun novas, the Earth stops its rotation, 
for about seven to eight hours, and then it goes and rotates in the opposite direction. We don't know how much it slows down before the event. We don't know if it's a few weeks or days or hours. It's probably days to weeks. Some of the mythologies in the American Indian and and other parts of the world talk about it and that the earth slowed down or the sun slowed down. And they have various mythologies about it, legends. But it slows down, then it goes in the opposite direction. And that's the key part. During that time, uh, guess what happens to the oceans? Well, just go in your backyard or if you go shopping, get your shopping ca- cart, bring a, a pie pan with you, a rectangular pie pan, fill the pie, p- put the pie pan on the bottom of the shopping cart, Fill the uh, the car the uh, thing with water the the pan with water, and slowly increase your speed with the uh, shopping cart to about two miles an hour, and then stop short, and you'll see what happens. <laughs> the water goes away from you, and then it sloshes back. Whatever's left it hasn't hasn't fallen out. So that's the origin of the great flood mythologies and legends throughout the world. That's what happens. There's a scientific reason why it happens, and it's described in series four why it happens. Anyway, uh, that that's some of the hard thing. Now, what causes the ice age? It's chemistry 101. In Seattle, we had an ice field that was like 4,000 feet thick. That's their estimate. So I had to figure out, okay, how much snow can create an ice field 4,000 feet thick? Because there's nothing written about it. You have to figure it out yourself. So I uh, went to the chemistry books, and all they had was how many calories of heat it takes to evaporate one uh, cubic centimeter of of distilled water. When you got ocean water, it's a lot more. So you've got a simple formula. If you have an ice field that's 4,000 feet thick, it represents snow. How do you get snow? You have to have clouds. How do you get clouds? You have to have water vapor. How do you get water vapor? You have to have a lot of heat on the surface of the oceans to evaporate a hell of a lot of water to make the water vapor. It eventually comes down in the form of snow. The ratio comes out to about 4.86 to 1. And there's there's a big variation. I was surprised the variation of the weight of snow and also the weight of glacial ice. So it depends on if the snow is dry and cold or it's wet snow. Depends on how much the damn thing weighs. <clears throat> anyway, uh, so it meant that Seattle had a, a snowfall of about 19,400 feet of snow to make an ice field that's 4,000 feet thick. You got the picture? I do. Not a pretty picture. <clears throat> Excuse me. So that's the problem. That's what happened. That's irrefutable. That's how you wind up getting an ice age. So if you see evidence of an ice age, like carbon-14 dating uh, drumlins and and the stuff that glaciers leave behind, moraine, and carbon-14 dated, that means that's when you had your reversal. And that's how I dated a lot of the stuff. But how, how, do, how do you... Volcanoes. I don't mean to interject, but how do you know exactly the time? Is it because you use ice core samples to do it or some, some other way? <clears throat> Ice Coast Campbell's only came later. Uh, no, it was it was basically once you know the model. Let me give you an example, so everybody will understand what's going on here. Philosophy is the main thing. You have to start with that first. A philosophy. Let's say you have a ten thousand piece puzzle. Now, if you don't have the picture, what this thing looks like when it's all done with, you pick up a piece. And you don't know where the hell it goes, do you? It's only after you have a picture that you pick up the piece and say, okay, this goes in the lower right, or this goes the upper left or in the middle. And you match up the color and the pa- and the pattern of the picture, and then you know where it is. The final picture is, a fo- is the philosophy. The philosophy has to come first. So when I saw the dating of the glacial till, the organic material like logs and stuff like that, corals, all kinds of stuff, seashells that were found all over the world in various level, levels, then I knew what what had happened. It was obvious then. That's the Ice Age. That combined with 
when you have a mass extinction, the same immediately after you have a geomagnetic reversal. The reversals are figured out by the remnant magnetization in the soils. Some clays have a high co uh, iron content. Lava sometimes does, depends on where it is. So you know then what, what, it, it, what happens. So with, with volcanoes, sometimes they've had logs found underneath the, the, um, the, the igneous rock, the, the rock that came from the lava, the lava. And they can date that, carbon-14 date it. And many times, I think about four instances, they were able to date it, and they fell within the standard deviation of the carbon-14 dating. So I had more than one way to know it. Besides the legends and myths uh, of Zoroastrians and Greeks and stuff like that, and the Egyptians, they all focused around 12,000 years. Well, they were right. Um, and, and that's, that's how, I, how I knew I had it. But I, I had to I get a lot of carbon-14 day and lead a lot of journals, uh, geology journals and stuff like that, to know... Uh, to have the hard evidence. So, I mean, are you saying that that's the how you do it. the last great flood or Noah's Ark happened about ten thousand BC? That would be about twelve thousand years ago, right? Yeah. So, so it coincides to what you're saying. Have you heard? I just out of curiosity, when you said you said something very interesting that caught my attention, when you said that perhaps some living beings come from another dimension. Are you familiar with the work of? A uh, very this, this happened 180 years ago. The work of Andrew Cross and the Akari insects. No, I, I think you should. You better understand when I when I say dimensions, I had to redefine dimensions. The way physics defines it now is length, width, depth, and time as the fourth dimension. I don't. The third dimension is the first layer of matter when matter comes into this dimension. The And it goes on from there. We are basically a fourth dimensional existence where we need our physical body to move things, touch things, eat and stuff like that. We can't read minds. At least most of us can't. And uh, so we're a fourth dimension. You have a, uh, an information that we would, you would say is your soul, but it's, it's an information that's strapped onto a carrier wave being transmitted to the same coordinates that make up your physical body, the atoms that make up your body. Then you have a fifth dimensional being who is something beyond an Uri Geller, where you can actually move an object just with your mind. I separate dimensions by how much potential and information that entity can wind up controlling and manipulating and using. It's different. Where time is not a separate dimension because it's common among all the dimensions, it's more like the rate at which this die hold transmits the information for all the dimensions. So it's not really a dimension, it's really a function of creation. I guess that's that's where I was going. Just just to let people know in case they wonder, what did you say, Mel, about the Akari insects? Well, this individual was doing some experiments with the electricity back in the 19th century. And what he found by doing that, all of a sudden, inside of a dome of glass, these insects materialized time and time again, and they were not there before. How did that happen? I don't know. But anyway, it's just that, that was a quick parenthesis. I don't mean to deviate from what you're saying. That's interesting. I'd like to see the experiment. <laughs> what kind of insect showed up? The Akari insects. But I'll forward that to you after. Good. <laughs> but uh, I go through it. Series one uh, is, is the definition of the theory of multidimensional reality. Part three is on the creation of the matter, of matter. It's the first four, dim uh, four uh, dimensions. And then part four is uh, uh, dimensions five through eight. And it also explains what gravity is. What happened? Let's, let's begin with what happened in 1957 and 1950. I think that's a precursor to a lot of your work, isn't it? <clears throat> that's correct. It's probably the most important. Uh, it's the culmination of all the proof uh, in series four of what causes the ice age and polar reversals. Uh, in December of 57 uh, was the last Gleisberg cycle. And our sun for a period of four or five days had over 320 to 340 or 50 sunspots in one day. <laughs> now, 
That's a lot. <laughs> our, our sun went nuts. It really expanded. Um, its output was it was much greater. In fact, the growing season for 2057 and, uh, 57 and 58 was 30 days greater than normal. The growing season, that's, that's called global warming. But it has nothing to do with mankind. It has to do with the sun. Got it? So that's that's really it. So what happened is within one or two months, they issued a stamp uh, called the International Geophysical Year. Now, that started at the beginning of 57 and ended at the end of 58. All the countries were part of it except for China. And uh, uh, they were studying basically the Earth and the sun. So the stamp has a semicrescent of the sun erupting. It has the, the picture from the Sistine Chapel, Michelangelo's, of the, the hand and finger of God almost touching the finger of Adam, as if to say, please help us so we don't die, you know? And then uh, above it, a geophysical year. But that doesn't make any sense either. This geophysical means the study of the earth. Why are they showing the sun? You got the picture? Who, who do you think, right. I, this is the, the stamp is what we're actually using for the promotional image of this interview, by the way. What do you think, who do you think designed that stamp, and is it conveying truth or a warning to humanity? It's like they can't keep a secret or they have to warn somebody. Mm -hmm. They figure no one's smart enough to figure this thing out anyway. I'll continue. It gets even funnier. Okay, by July 30th, they passed the law that created NASA. I think it passed in July 30th, 1958. And why did they create NASA? To go to the moon and bring the samples back. What was the name of the project of, of the flight that goes to the moon? Apollo. It was called Apollo. Apollo is the Greek sun god. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> so they sent the Greek sun god to the moon to bring back the samples from the surface of the moon that proved that the sun know it. Bingo. So... The next video that's coming out is uh, in video series four, part five H. I actually, for the last month and a half, I have been reading uh, presidential executive orders from Nixon all the way to Trump. And because in, in video series part um, uh, 5G, uh -oh. I'm not going to be censored from from uh, YouTube or anything like that. And, and you'll find out as, as you see the videos and hear this, this interview. Okay. I know more than they do. They need me more than I need them. And you'll understand it the minute you see the videos. And I'll, I'll try to go through it. Anyway, they, there's been reported that the Department of Health and um, HUD, Housing and Urban Development, and the Defense Department refuses to show over $21 trillion worth of money. They didn't lose it. They know where they spent it. It's just not showing anybody. And I'm really curious. I was curious about that. And I had written a letter to three of the leadership in the Pentagon back in August. They got it on August 20th. And 12 business days later, I got an answer back. My letter was about 850 words. I got a response of... Uh, it was 1,950 words, and it had 24 questions and five comments that I also had to answer. I go through them in that previous, uh, I should say this, five and then space part G. <laughs> Is that you want, instead of 5G, I say that instead. That's so, okay. Uh, so uh, I go through some of it. I didn't show the whole letter I got from them, but it's it obviously, they were really concerned. It was obviously the Defense Department did not like what the CIA was doing, and so the CIA was put in charge of this thing. Now, I'll, I'll go, let me go on further. I'll try to tie this thing there so you understand what's going on. Okay, they went to moon, they landed there, and I think I can tell you when they landed, and they, they um, okay, here it is. 
They landed on the moon on July 20th, 1969. July 24th, they came back to the Earth with the, with the uh, samples from the moon. And on September 26th, just about not even two months later, um, Dr. Thomas Gold had a contract with NASA, and his job was to figure out why there were these small five-inch and one- and two-foot craters on the moon with, like, glass on the bottom and glazing on, on moon rocks and stuff like that. And uh, his article came out then, and I'll, I'll basically uh, – I'm looking at the, the PDF to show this. I'm going to have it. His article is in the journal Science, volume 168, page 1345. And dated September 26th of 69. And the abstract says this. Some glazing is apparently due to radiation heating. It suggests a, a giant solar outburst in geologically recent times. In the article, and you'll see it on the video when it's, when it's out. I'll probably put it together by either tonight or tomorrow. The phenomena may not be in the form in the nature of a flare, but in the nature of a very minor nova-like outburst of the sun. The nova phenomena among the stars is not understood. That's absolutely true, and even today. One can therefore not completely rule out the possibility that stars that are like the sun do have occasional instantaneous or internal or, uh, origin, but very much weaker than the nova. He's wrong about that. Uh, there is no mini nova. There's no micro nova. Remove it from your alphabet, your your vocabulary. It, 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 call it a solar solar flare, a solar cycle, but it is not a nova. A nova happens on the clock cycle, and the way you know it's it's not a little tiny flare. From the last reversal, last ice age. The water, uh, the sea level was down about 420 to 450 feet. When you figure out how much, I figured out how much water could be evaporated for 350 feet of ocean water, every square foot. Uh, and it comes out to every square foot was, had to apply, had to apply 6 billion calories of heat to every square foot of ocean water worldwide to make the worldwide um, sea level go down by 350 feet. It goes down 400 feet. You're talking about seven or eight billion calories, especially since it's salt water, not fresh water. It takes more heat. At that point, you realize you're talking about a nova. You got it. It is a nova. And a couple of the legends from South America and other places say they saw the the Earth melt, turn red. That's what they're talking about. It's not a joke. This thing happens every 12,068 years. We are the result of a few people that survived it last time. I'm doing these videos, and I did the books, because I'm trying to better our odds. So question, back to what government did, which is probably what is most everybody will be concerned about. In October 28, that's one month after Thomas Gold's article hit the journal Science. Nixon had uh, a, a large executive um, uh, order, number 11490. It was over 17,000 words. Um, it says, it, its title was Assigning Energy Preparedness Functions to Federal Departments and Agencies. That was just after Thomas Gold and, the, and, the, and the, the stuff came back from the moon, and they knew the sun knew it. And, and that's what happened. I've read the whole thing. The video will go through some of the parts that are blatantly in there. Now, some of it, obviously, we're still in the Vietnam War. So there were some things about legitimate war and stuff like that. But the word war does not show up in that whole 17,300-word document only four times. Emergency is an attack, but you consider... And a stellar nova, an attack on the United States. So it goes through, and I figured out all of the executive orders that had to do with this event, buried in others. Some of the executive orders were incorporated, like, for instance, Reagan in, 19, in November 18, 1988, that's after the election, and he was going to leave office. 
he has an executive order that ends Nixon's executive order, but includes a lot of the stuff in it. And then 10 days later, November 28th of 1988, he has the Robert T. Stanford Disaster Relief and Emergency Assistance Act. 71,600 words. I read it. <laughs> and I got news here. So he embedded the uh, some of Nixon's executive order as well as his own in there. You like the work I've done? <laughs> Isn't that amazing? <clears throat> Well, let's just dissect all of this. Let's go back to, to the moon, for example. I've always wondered, and I'm glad you're saying it, Apollo, and the reason was because of the sun, because I always wondered, why isn't it called Selene, Apollo, the, the Selene mission, because that's the Greek goddess of the moon. So what happened in 1957, you think that was the trigger that created that NASA? A, to, right. To figure out every great secret, you have to find an event in time that caused another group of people or nations to react to it. And that was it. Uh, I mean, you, you don't understand, uh, unless you see some of the videos, they actually had the aurora borealis down to the mid latitudes of the United States and all over Europe. It scared a lot of people. It really did scare a lot of folks. That's why. Now, uh, to prove my point also, in the next video, 5H, hopefully they won't censor that word, um, the, I have also a link for the first interview of the three astronauts, the two that were on the moon. And when you see their faces and their behavior, they're not happy at all. This no. is not even 90, six, 90 days after the— I've always wondered that, uh, Doug. Everyone has. You would think anyway, that they would be jumping like for joy. Yeah, it looks like they were at a funeral. And you should read the, you should read the comments, though. It's hilarious. Uh, I mean, I'm not the only one seeing it. You're seeing it. Hundreds of people saw it. Now you know why. I think what happened is when they came back with the samples, it's what they were walking on also. They saw the glazing. They must have been walking on the glass beads are deposited over the previous glass beads from a previous Nova. And also infalls from uh, stellar wind and stuff like that, that that glazed over and basically melted from the sun when it when it annulled it. And they must have been like walking on glass. I mean, there's no sound there, but they could feel it in their feet. Crunch, crunch, crunch. And so they must have gone to a deep debriefing when they landed and they must have been told what it was about and what not to say what they saw or what they walked on. And that's why they look so sad. They had to have been told why. And that's why they look like they were just at a funeral. They just found out the sun Nova, and that was the whole purpose of the Apollo mission. But still, couldn't you mix a bit of joy? Yes, okay, we can find out if this occurs in certain intervals. But the fact that we allegedly, and I say allegedly because most people know that, I sometimes question that, what they presented to us. But anyway, that's a different story. But the fact that they actually went to the moon is the biggest technological accomplishment for humankind that we know of. Perhaps other civilizations prior to the last polar reversal had better things than we do now, but they were decimated by the cataclysm that occurred. What's your take on that? Um, Neil Officer was interviewed years later. I think it was 10 years later or something like that, a few years Later, and he would look a lot happier. I think he was able to mentally uh, uh, um, come to grips with what he had learned. And I mean, they were all under secret uh, secrecy agreements that they couldn't say anything. And so, uh, but I think he he was just relegated to that. Now, remember, when Nixon did his executive order, they were in the next midst of the next sunspot cycle. They didn't know if that thing was going to go off. They they had no total ignorance of how the sun really works and what this was all about. By the way, uh, a solar cycle is 11.09 years. Eight of those is called a Gleisberg cycle of 88.73 plus years. 136 Gleisberg cycles is 12,068 years. There's your clock cycle. There's a synchronizing and resynchronizing frequencies all geared to the main clock cycle. That's why you can't figure it out 
In this dimension, you have to go to how this reality is created. That's the part a lot of people have a hard time grasping. I get some who are scientists and stuff like that, and amateur scientists, they understand it because they, they thought something was wrong. In fact, some of the earlier videos I have in video one, I go through the scientists that knew something was wrong. Some very big names in physics from the past and present. They knew something was wrong. They just couldn't put their finger on it, and they never developed the idea. They didn't know where to start. So this is not, you know, this isn't really new. It's just I'm the first to ever develop it and create an information theory of existence. Obviously, this is a secret, probably top secret, because I've always been asked, Mel, do you think if the government knows that a cataclysm is about to happen, or in the future, would they tell us? And I've always said, I don't think no. so. Because, yes. the, because the government is there to protect domestic tranquility. And how can you do so if you know that there's no way you can save everyone? Uh, good point. At this point, I'm going to explain something really important. I'm going to explain it in the video also. One, uh, the government knows I'm right about how the universe is created and stuff like that. They produced a paper, and I had it in the last video, I think, not, um, I think, uh, 5F, I think, uh, and, no, no, it was 5G, and they, they had an article done in 1988, and they, or not, 1983, my first book was out in 77, printed by May of, of 78, we gave a copy uh, to um, Luis Alvarez, and uh, his son also, who professors at uh, Berkeley, but Luis Alvarez was a Nobel Prize winner in physics, and he was part of the Jason group, top secret group. They do reports that are all classified top secret. And he did a paper. He's the one who came up with the idea or tried to find a way to explain the extinction of the dinosaurs uh, uh, as a comet or meteor hitting the Earth. He was looking for the iridium um, isotopes and because that had to come from the sun. He knew it. And he actually, I cover it in one of the earlier uh, series four that it's kind of funny. He actually makes a deliberate error in the paper he filed in, in science and then we change it. He says, look for this Nova event 0.1 um, parsecs from the earth or solar system. Well, the nearest star is like three or four uh, parsecs away. So he's really saying, you look, look here. It was, <laughs> you look right at our sun. That's that, you know, that's where it is. That's, that's the cause of it. So are you saying that it was not a comet? It was another Nova? No, no, it's not. It's not another Nova. It is our sun. All stars Nova. That's what the six blank. Right. Were. But it was not a comet. What did, was kill the, the dinosaurs? Oh, it was, it was most likely a, a big Nova. It may have been one. The sun produced Mercury, or wouldn't be Venus, but probably Mercury. It was just so devastating, the amount of energy that it releases when it created a planet, like giving birth, that uh, it, it's just, it's just like, hang on, let me end that stuff. Uh, and so I think that's what kind of happened. But let, let me go to the, the guts of this thing, what's happened. <clears throat> Nixon winds up doing this executive order, 110490. And guess what agency he winds up giving it to to keep this thing a secret and to find out find out the truth, what it's all about, to do the research. Guess who? The CIA. You got it. He handed it to the wrong agency to deal with this. The CIA is a wonderful spy agency. At least it was then. And their their business is basically to lie, to keep secrets to lie to opponents to get information out of them. So what was their natural way of approaching this problem? We're going to lie, and, and basically no one's going to figure it out. And I show the first cabinet meeting of Reagan where um, the, the um, head of the CIA winds up telling him, let me see if I can find it so I can quote it exactly. Because Oh, here it is. It's really funny. Uh, Bill Casey, uh, the meeting was in 1981. This is when he first, it's the first cabinet meeting. And quote, 
We'll know our disinformation program is complete when everything the American public believes is false. Mm -hmm. Close quotes. That's an accurate quote, by the way. There was one by George Herbert Walker Bush uh, to a well-known friend, uh, newswoman, uh, and she, he said to her, if the American people knew what we were, we were doing, they'd chase us down the street and hang us in the nearest lamp poster. They could hang them. And now you understand why. They knew it. What they did, and I show in one of the earlier videos, they had control uh, of the National Science Foundation. And they're on the board of directors. And they decide which papers get published and which don't. So if you have a paper or project that you want to prove that the sun knows it or may have caused a previous extinction, you don't get the funding. The weakness in the college system and the, the National Science Foundation thing, and I, I figured this one out, the scientists can only take two months of salary from the grant, but the school administrators can take as much as they want. Could be half, could be more. So really what this is, the National Science Foundation stuff is, is nothing more than a payoff to school administrators, colleges and universities, to toe the line and do what they want. Gatekeepers. That's why they, that's why they force the professors to apply for grant money and do papers, because they want the money. That's one thing I learned in accounting. Follow the money trail, and that's it. So they corrupted the science community. Now you understand why they couldn't figure this stuff out. They can't. They, they, then we get to the building of, of tunnel systems and stuff like that. And I'll go through it in the next video. I went into the last video. Uh, before, before you go there, before you go there, then, before you go there, Doug, yeah. let's go step by step. I don't want to just leave anything behind that we may not be able to re-grasp again. Why are they blaming us and not the sun? It's, it's simple. They have to come up with cover stories to explain. It's just like Luis Alvarez had to wind up saying a meteor hit the place and calls the extinction of the dinosaurs. No. So they instead blame carbon, an increase in carbon as global warming. Well, I got news here. When we're all locked down during most of 2020, guess what? The world warmed up. Yep. It didn't cool down. It warmed up, even though it was less carbon in the air. You like that? I guess they screwed up on that one, didn't they? <laughs> How come the media didn't say it? Look, well, we have bought and paid for. It. Of course, I, of and course. I know why. I found, I found the law, which enabled them to do this, and why the media has done this. These people have been promised, besides being paid off, they've been been paid they've been promised a golden survival ticket for them and their family and their grandkids that's why they're doing this that's why trump said he had 50 people lawyers investigating when they presented the evidence to the justice department and the fbi and, and other attorney generals nobody would even look at it and take it why? You'll find out. In the law that Nixon had, and later Obama, where he listed almost all the same departments, and then later Trump did not list some of them, guess what? The Attorney General's office is listed in there. Now tell me why would the Attorney General's office be listed for a farm, uh, um, an executive order about farm and filming, helping farm and rural communities. There's no reason. In the video, you'll see the whole list. I matched them all up. But it's funny which ones don't show up in, in Trump's. That's why they went after him. Because two of the, of the entities that are the ones responsible for supply and building this stuff, namely HUD and also FEMA, and also um, Homeland Security are not listed on his on his bill. <laughs> I'm not kidding. So I don't think they ever told him about this stuff. I don't you, think they told him about the cave systems 
And what's going to happen? You mentioned you mentioned HUD for a second. You and I were talking on the phone a few hours before we started today, and you said something interesting. Why would they, what would Trump appoint a brain surgeon as the head of, yes, of uh, of uh, housing and urban development? Yeah, I know. A guy in uh, housing and urban development, they do building, they construct things. You're supposed to have somebody there who knows what the cost of steel, concrete, gypsum, I mean, you know, things to build a house or a building, not a brain surgeon. <laughs> it made no sense. The only builder in the whole administration was, guess who? Trump. Trump. And I think that's why. Now, the other my after I, I spoke to you, I went through his, uh, uh, his executive orders and bills and house bills, which mentioned HUD. And I got news to you. The only time is a House bill and the president's concerns about the bill that they're spending too much money. He wanted to cut their budget for some things by three and a half billion dollars and other things, a half a billion, a whole bunch of stuff. Uh, and I think the people Obama had set up, uh, I'll tell you which one it is so you know. In, where is it? Here it is. In in uh, June 9th of 2011, uh, Executive Order 13575, it's only 890 words. It's to establish the White House Rural Council. This Rural Council has almost all of the same people listed in Nixon's emergency preparedness um, Executive Order 11, 9, uh, 11490. Now, why do you need the Secretary of Defense and a whole bunch of others have nothing to do with agriculture? And, and the executive order is just boilerplate. It doesn't help anybody. It's nothing. It's, it's irrelevant. And you'll see it in the video. When Trump does his, his is April 25th, 2017. That's only about four months, three months after he took office. And he winds up creating his executive order is 13790. It's 1,156 words. I've read the thing. I have it. Promoting agriculture and rural prosperity in America and revokes Obama's executive order 13575. What he didn't know and what nobody did was that Obama's executive order 13575 was a place where the people, the heads of the departments can get together and plan these survival caves, how to, how to supply them, build them, and get done with them. And here Trump thinks it's really for farms, and he eliminates FEMA from it. He eliminates Homeland Security. He eliminates um, HUD from it. And a lot of the money came from HUD. You like that? Now you understand why they went after him. The attorney general was part of the meetings. They're all listed. You'll see it. It's hilarious. This is what happened. They're all compromised because they were, they were promised something that their money could not buy. The same thing goes for all of Silicon Valley, Facebook, Twitter, all of them. They must have been compromised and told, we'll give you this golden survival ticket if you play ball with us and do what we say. I was told a story about David Rockefeller, told, had a close friend, and he told him about this thing, survival and stuff like that. The guy didn't like it, wasn't going to do it. It was against his morals. And David Rockefeller gave him up as a friend. Didn't talk to him anymore. That doesn't have so, to, that doesn't, it was, is that Aaron Russo by chance? Don't know. I don't know. Somebody told me about the story. Uh, someone out in the audience will probably know it and what it is. But the point is, is other, I've heard other stories that people have been offered something. They worked for a company and they were an important employee. By the way, the law, a couple of the laws wind up saying the uh, Department of Labor is supposed to keep track uh, and National Science Foundation keep track of important people, you know, scientists and and engineers and technical people that do things, they're on the list. Those are some of the people they're going to save. 
because they want to restart the population in the future. Okay, but they made a colossal mistake. Now, I should probably probably say about what uh, DARPA. The, the, the last video, 5G, which you hate me to say, but I can't help myself. I'm just addicted to it. <laughs> That's all right. We already said it a few times, so go ahead. It doesn't matter. It's part 5G. Um, I go into DARPA. I got done with my series for the earlier stage of all the proofs that the sun novas and the, the, the ice, which caused the ice age, the flood, everything. It's all done by about March or April of 2019. Well, guess what? DARPA, which is part of the Defense Department, it's defense research. They have a, a contest. I'm not kidding. A subterranean contest. And they want industry, private individuals or universities from around the world, they don't care, they're that desperate, to develop an autonomous robot to be able to maneuver and go through a cave system. And they're spent minds. The one that they show on the video is literally a, probably a gold mine that they had, that somebody had spent, you know, they used it, you know, they, they used it. It was, a, I know the government was buying empty and abandoned gold mines and silver and copper mines and stuff like that. So they bought these mines and they use this thing for the test site. So they had dummies there, one laying down on the ground like it's dead. The other one propped up against the wall of the cave. The, the robots had to recognize a sign, which means it had a, do optical character recognition. They recognize the sign, the letters, and convert the letters to ASCII text, and it looks up in their database what that means. And the two signs they had in this test were survivor hole. <laughs> survivor hole. This is not about mine safety at all. If it was done, if it was for mine safety, it would have been done through the Department of Interior, U.S. Geological Survey. They're the ones in charge of hard rock mining. Nobody else, not the U.S. military or DARPA. That's what happened. So they want the robot to wind up maneuvering through a cave, a mine, with all kinds of obstacles, including part of the uh, one of the, the um, uh, tunnels that had a partial collapse, maneuver around that, spot different things. They had uh, backpacks, um, drills, these two dummies. Now, what was interesting, what gave it away, they had one of the dummies was plugged in, was a heated dummy. Now, it was wearing a jacket. So, in other words, the hands and the face would glow infrared. They want these robots to be able to tell if somebody's dead or alive. Mm -hmm. You got the picture? Now, some would say this is indirectly proving my point, but... I think you can almost consider this directly proving something that's very important. One, that for some reason, a human being could not get to the cave entrance to go into it to see if anybody's alive or what the condition is. Something's blocking the cave entrance that they can't get to. Two, they don't ex they're going to have these robots pre-positioned probably a, a docking station where it would charge up and also upload or download information. And then they would have, somehow they would wind up turning it on remotely, probably with microwave, and it would go through the whole cave system and report what they see. When the battery runs low, they go back to the charging station and upload the data. What it means is this, and they're saying it loud and clear, and it's only because of my videos, because they didn't know this before, that there will be thousands of feet from one to maybe 4,000 feet of glacial ice and snow over the cave entrances, and those people will not be able to get out. They'll run out of oxygen before they run out of toilet paper. That's why they're admitting it. What's going to block them? The ice and snow. And they won't be able to even get there until maybe 20, 30, or 40 years after. It's got to stop snowing. Also, be able to get out of where you are if you're, if you're by the uh, equator, where it's, we assume it's going to melt first there, to go up and, and find out who's left. That's the problem. 
They're admitting it. So all these golden survival tickets they've given these guys, I'm sure senators and congressmen too, wouldn't want to leave them out, plus the bureaucracy, it's going to be their tomb. Two movies come to mind, Doug. Two movies. And before we take a break, I want to say this. Did you ever see, watch the movie 2012? Oh, of course, it's Hollywood. I get that. Oh. Roland Emmerich loves my stuff. Oh, okay. He's, he's right. my stuff in already two of his movies, maybe a third. There you have it. The Day After Tomorrow and 2012. And when I saw 2012, it no, was just... The Day After Tomorrow. Oh. I'm talking about the, the Fifth Floor. The Fifth Floor. Is that a movie? Yep. About a bunch of computer engineers, scientists made a, a world, a whole world within a computer. And they entered the computer... And they play. It's like fantasy land. Like SimCity, a nature, nature it's reality. But you have to watch it. The, the only credit I got from him was the star of the movie, his name was Douglas. <laughs> that was it. <laughs> well, let me ask you this about 2012, that movie. Because, well, obviously, sure. they, they make the Chinese the saviors because China owns half of Hollywood now. But this part, that they're buying the politicians, they're buying all those people who will be integral when it comes to this situation. You see those cities in China, the ghost towns full of buildings that are empty. And sometimes you wonder, could they be there for the future? And this is why they're positioned in China as the greatest superpower in order for these people to survive. Because what you're saying, they might not be able to survive underground for a while, but perhaps certain parts of China might. No. Um the gesture is going to go after this reversal from east to west rather than west to east. What body of huge body of water is just east of China and Japan and uh, all of Indochina? South of the South China Ocean. Sea, Pacific Ocean, right? All, all that cold, moist air is going to be dumping a hell of a lot of snow and eventually it'll be ice on China. They're going to have a very, very bad ice age just like the East Coast will. Last time, the West Coast did. I mean, it's still, this time it'll still have an ice field, but it's not going to maybe be 4,000 feet thick. It may only be 500 or 1,000 feet thick, or even less. I don't know. But the jet stream is the thing that carries this moisture and snow. And it's, believe me, when you have that much water evaporated, at least 400 to 500 feet of ocean water, that's a tremendous amount of water. You're not going to see the sun for one or two sunspot cycles until the sun produces this dust shell around it that produces the, the infrared light that heats us up. So if there's going to be a change well, in... say the same thing too. If, the, if there's going to be a change in direction, right? The, the, earth, the, 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 the polarity will change and it's going to go the other way. Change direction, right. 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 So the question is, there has to stop at one moment or slow down and stop. Could this be what we see in the Sahara Desert? That the sun was sand stationary there? there for a while, and it burned everything to the ground. Well, also, the sand may have come from the ocean, also moved there. The, the way to prove it, people are probably saying, well, how, the earth, how could the Earth possibly stop and go the other direction? There's a reason why, and it's in, it's in the videos in Series 4. Um, it's very simple. You have deep-sea canyons from all, found all over the world that go down. If you have a river like you know, the Nile or... Mississippi, uh, Delaware River, uh, Hudson River, that channel goes all the way past the, the, the continental shelf, all the way down to about ten or 11,000 feet below current sea level. It actually cut a river channel down there. The only way that could happen is if there was no ocean water there, because fresh water is lighter than salt water and goes on top. It only deposits sediment like the Mississippi Delta and the Nile Delta, but it does not cut a groove in it, a canyon. These canyons are bigger than the Grand Canyon, a lot bigger. There's one off of Santa Barbara, which I show on, on, on the videos also. It's huge. It goes all the way down. The only way that can be is there was no ocean water there. The only way that can be is when the Earth stops its rotation, it keeps going, and if you were the... This time, if you're at the edge of the continental shelf, during the reversal, you could look down 10,000, 11,000 feet, and you'll see the bottom of the Atlantic. 
until it's until it sloshes back and it's going to push you back and probably the, the slosh back will probably go another 100 miles inland. So, you know, you're not as you're not going to escape that part of it. But that that's what happens. It's that's why so few people people survived it. That's why you have the mass extinctions during these polar reversals. It's not a joke. We have to take our one and only break, but one thing that occurred to me, what you said about NASA, that something has to happen. There should be a precursor to an event, and that's why we see these agencies pop up. And I'm thinking of the Antarctic Treaty. All of a sudden, I believe it was the 1959 when uh, the treaty was signed. Then all of a sudden we see Argentina, Australia, Belgium, Chile, France, Japan, New Zealand, Norway, South Africa, United Kingdom, the United States, and the Soviet Union. And now there are even more signatories to that treaty. I want to get your answer on the other side as to what happened. And now we cannot even go there for any reason to explore, to mine, to drill. Nothing can happen in that part of the world. But how can people learn more about your work, watch your videos, and so on, Doug? Yep. Um, Dialfoundation.com or Vector Associates is the book publisher. And... Just search for Die Hole Foundation on YouTube and then click on videos and you'll see all the videos listed there. There's a lot of facets to this phenomenon. And one of the first videos I put up, I said, this is the greatest secret the country has. And I wasn't kidding. This is the greatest secret. There's nothing greater. And now it's out. And when we come back, folks, we're going to get deeper. I know that Doug has written to the government and you'd be amazed at some of the things that he has gotten in return. There's a lot of interest to what he has to say. And this is probably expected not that long from now. Douglas Vogt is my special guest today. This is Mel Hostlerick, and you are listening to Veritas. Don't go anywhere. And welcome back to Veritas. I'm Mel Hostlerick, and my special guest today is Douglas Vogt. Doug, I have a question. Who is responsible? When we talk about global warming. A lot of people think that it's just our cars, the cows, the air we breathe. Who is responsible for saying that? There must have been someone who came up with that. Uh, William Boucher from Lamont Doherty. He's the grandfather of blaming man and glo global warming on carbon-14. He's the one. I have his article. And he, uh, I've read the article a number of times. And no place in the article does he mention the word sun at all or solar. It's only blaming CO2 and stuff like that. And he, he was a geologist. Uh, Lamont Dury is part of Columbia University, heavily influenced by the CIA. So uh, that's why he wrote the paper. And about two or three years later, I mentioned in one of the videos that a, another scientist wrote a paper and said there was over a thousand articles that show the sun earth weather connection. I mean, anybody with an IQ above 80 or 90 knows you go outside, sun's out, warms up, and hey, guess what? It gets warm. Clouds come, hey, it's going to get cooler. Not the William Boucher. And that's the problem. He recently died. And he's the guy who did it. That's your starting point. That's who did it. Well, then the question, the theory just came to mind. If the government is deflecting from the, the truth and they blame us for global warming right. instead of the sun, and they know what is coming, is the multi-trillion dollar tax that they're proposing throughout the world it's for them to use those funds in order to build more underground facilities? Is that why? Um, as they say, follow the money trail. Most likely... They, they, they'll say it for housing and stuff like that, but the money is going to be siphoned off to build shelters for themselves. And I think that's what it's all about. Uh, but remember, be, because of Nixon gave this project to the CIA, the problem was that the, the, they shouldn't have been given it. It should have been given to um, Department of Interior, uh, USGS, as well as NOAA and NASA. And because when you, you wind up lying, then you wind up and deceiving two and a half generations of scientists to think only one way, then you're not going to get a, a, a truthful answer to, to build shelters that you're going to be 
they actually save you. So they built them in the wrong places and they're not going to survive this thing. They can't. There's no way. And, and DARPA is basically admitting this isn't going to work. Now they're doing it because of my work and my writings and my videos that plainly saw what happens. They didn't know the extent of what happens during the reversal. They, they had in the fog is because nobody's taught it. They weren't taught the truth because they couldn't. The two reasons, one, you had this matter theory of existence thanks to the Pisos, the Calpurnius Pisos of Rome. And two, oh, I don't want to leave the Catholic Church out. They're the ones who promoted it. And for a reason, you'll know why in part two. And then you have uh, the CIA getting involved. Their reaction is keep everything a secret. Don't tell anybody and deceive everybody. So no one come to this great secret. But they just, when they went to go get professional advice or intelligent advice, they went to the, the same people they brainwashed for over 35 or 40 years. I mean, what's the point? You see what I'm getting at? So they got bad information. It's garbage in, garbage out. That's what happened. But obviously someone knows the non-trash part. They're not giving the right information to them. That's why they never would have built anything as far north. I knew when they built that, that seed bank in Norway. Sweet, in Norway, mm -hmm. that's beyond stupid. You know when you'll be able to get use of, use of it, if you could ever find it again? When it melts? Probably in about 2,000 years after the reversal. Because it's going to be even Very. more more ice? Is that what you're saying? Oh, yeah. Up there? They have so many glaciers. There was a glacier that was in Colorado, for instance. It didn't melt until 8,000 years ago. It was, it was around for 4,000 years. You got the picture? I do. And this begs another question. If this is really happening, and I believe that they, the year, because these are specific intervals, right? This happens yep. exactly you when you is it? Atomic clock to it. 2046, is that the, the year you're predicting? Yeah, this, the way I figured it out is not only the, the, the solar cycles, you have to recognize the Gleisberg cycle is a, re, is a synchronizing frequency. The sunspot cycles are resynchronizing frequencies. There are other frequencies. There's one that's 1,508 years. There's 3,000. There's a 6,000. There may be a 6,000-year one. They're all functions or factors of the 12,068 years. I also, shockingly enough, found the number embedded in the Torah. That's what series, there's a couple series. One is on the Moses 10 code systems. I'll tell you what series that is. And it's related to this stuff. You know, see how, how I figured it out and how I found it. It's in series six and parts one through one and two. And uh, the, the Torah is embedded with this number, 12,068. You, you have to figure out the length of the sacred cubit, which is 24.136. <laughs> Again, you see that's two, two times the 12,068, but the decibel points. And you multiply that by just about all the numbers, all the measurement numbers, and a lot of the other numbers, in the Torah. And they all distill down to the 12,068, or 6,034, 3,017, or two times the number, or three times the number. In fact, the number of chapters and verses in the Torah is 6,034, half the number. The total number of chapters and verses in what we call the Old Testament and that includes books that the Pisos forced the Jews to insert, totals 24,136, two times the number. So we know in the first and second centuries, they knew about the number, but they didn't know what it represented. They knew it was a holy number, but they didn't know why. Now you all know why. But it's embedded. Actually, the Torah, uh, in series seven, I found God's code system. Moses didn't know it. God actually has embedded in Genesis the exact month, the day, and the year of this reversal. That was the shocker. And it's found in the Genesis where it says the skies opened up and the rain and the rains fall and stuff like that. And the second month, the 17th day. 
but we don't care about the month and day. Who cares uh, how many years ago? I mean, we, what year was it? Well, it tells you the year too. Uh, in Deuteronomy, uh, which was translated by Jeremiah under his scribe's name of Shaphan. That's why he uses some words that were common for the time of the fall of the temple, but not the time of Moses, because he's the guy who did the translation. So uh, he says, look at the years of many generations. And you go back to Genesis. When you total from Abraham to, to, to um, from Adam to Abraham, when they had their first kid, except Adam, it's his third kid, son, it totals 2,046. So I had a month, a day, and the year. And it turned out to be October 16th, 2046. When you go back every 12,068 days from that drop dead date, something important happened in history, directly or indirectly, that has to do with the Jewish people or something like that. Even involves the United States. And, and uh, Sir Walter Rowley actually buying the charter from Humphrey Gilbert to develop the new world for the for England. It all falls on one of these dates. It's amazing. I found over 45 or 50 of them. That's what's in series seven. So let me ask you this then based on that information. Yeah, they've given us, he's given us a drop dead date. Okay, do you think intentional depopulation is likely and is it what we're witnessing right now in preparation for this coming event? Well, that's okay. Let's go into what um, I wrote the letter to the army officer, and I go into more of it in in the other in um, series four, part five G, and I don't say the whole letter because I don't want to cover the things that I talked about in my letter. But these are the things that were kind of shocking. It's the only reason I, I would do this, and he's not. He didn't contact me. Uh, formally uh, as a representative of the Defense Department. But I knew it came from them because, you know, he mentioned 14 of the 15 things that were mentioned in my letter to them. And the 15th one was actually indirectly. It would have to, about, had to do with the Isra uh, Hebrew alphabet. Anyway, this is what he wrote. It'll be on the next video. My opinion. And he says, my opinion. Internet... Uh, Intentional depopulation in the near term appears likely. Much of the underground infrastructure required may already have been constructed. It appears that the true U.S. government debt may exceed $91 trillion, which begs a host of questions and, and makes the belief plausible. Even before COVID, there were was Agenda 21 and multiple executive orders, i.e., EO 13575. That's Obama's that I talked about earlier. He's pointing to it. Why is he pointing to it? He may have figured I was a good researcher. I'm going to try to figure out why. And I did. That was that executive order got these guys to, together, the one the same ones that are listed in, in Nixon's uh executive order. And that's the ones, the working group, to put this stuff together. And then Trump. <laughs> takes it apart and changes it. That's, I think, why they went after him. Anyway, I believe that there is a planned global movement towards fascism. By the way, that's not right-wing. That is left-wing. National socialism is left-wing. National socialism, communism, and socialism are nothing more than a redoing of feudalism. Top-down rule and the people are the property of the state. <clears throat> I'll continue. With the end of facilitating the careful, orchestrated, and significant implosion of global populations with special emphasis on the elimination of Kissinger's useless eaters. You like that? Doesn't that make you feel all warm and cozy inside? Now, the Defense Department is basically admitting here they don't like what the CIA's plan is. They don't like what they're doing. And... I'm sure there's people in the CIA that do not like this either and probably are very happy the information is getting out. That's why I don't think I'm ever going to be shut down on YouTube or anyplace else. It's because if you're the owner of YouTube, 
you know, Google or Facebook or any of the others, you want to know this stuff also. After all, the agency made a promise to you and you just found out you're all dead meat. You're not shutting me up. You want an answer, don't you? They've been using my videos to know what the mechanism is because they don't know it. That's the problem. Why wouldn't they know it if they have an unlimited source of funding? How do they not know this? It's simple. It's the philosophy. I keep telling you that. It's all about philosophy, the foundation philosophy. If you have a, a matter or in a foundation philosophy, you look at everything as being matter. Even light is looked at as matter. The particles, subatomic particles are looked at as matter rather than waveforms. It, that's the mistake. You're looking for a cause for this thing within the creation of this reality. A comet hit it. A meteor hit it. Um, somebody farted too much. Who knows? It, that's why they keep hitting dead ends. I mean, the idea of a black hole in the center of a galaxy is so easy to prove wrong. It's a joke. They had to have known this was nonsense. I, in one of the papers in Series 1, Part 9 and 8, I go through even Stephen Hawking, the poster boy for black holes. He disavows it. That's why he released that executive, his, his, his journal article after he died. He was too much of a coward to be alive and to have to answer it. He mentions holograms in there about 14 or 15 times. Never black holes. Doesn't. I, I even know what changed his mind. It was 2011 that did it. My irony, he died the very same day, Pi Day, that I did my first video. March 14th, 2018. That's when he died, and that's my first video, and I did not plan it that way. March 14, 2018. That's right. I have a question about uh, Hawking. I've always wondered how he lasted so long, and I wonder if he was used as a pawn. All that information was being fed to him. No, no. I, I even have his, his PhD thesis downloaded. I have a lot of his papers. And I know when he started changing. It was a paper. He referenced the paper in 2011. Uh, and it mentions holograms. And after that, he gradually changes. What I did is I counted how many conditional statements were in his journal articles. Now, a conditional statement is if, maybe, or, could be, things like that. Those are conditional statements. Uh, and they got less and less when he started getting into a holographic universe. They have to understand when you say it's a holographic universe or it's an, an analogy of a hologram, you are saying that the universe is the product of information. There's only two ways to create a hologram. The most common way is that the information exists in a computer and it modulates two reference beams through lasers and modulates them. When the two lasers meet, it creates the image. That means the information for the image exists in another time-space relationship. Got it? I know this stuff is above a lot of people's heads, but that's why no one can figure it out. Well, you opened that door. Never will. You opened that door, Doug. How true do you think the notion is that we live in a matrix or a digital reality? The people who did the matrix read my first book because in part two of that matrix, where the guy is... This guy who's the controller is sitting in a room full of TV screens. Remember that issue? And Neo walks sure. into it. Guess what? Those lines came right from reality revealed. That's very interesting because I was having a conversation with one of the alleged writers years ago regarding the polar reversal. So I wonder if they were reading your books back then. Well, the first one goes back to... It was in print by May of, of 78, so do the math. I've been researching this stuff since 69, so it's over 50 years. You see, I've read so many journal articles that I've seen theories come and go. Some deserve to go. But I know that the, the, the sequence of events of how it went, how someone came up with an idea, and other scientists will either try to prove it right or prove it wrong or test it. So I have this body of knowledge that I've seen a lot and read a lot. I once had a library of at least 2,000 journal articles I Xeroxed 
from UCLA, Stacks, and uh, University of Washington library. I spent way too much time in libraries. Uh, so that's that's basically it. It was just it. The whole thing is to me is a sad story. I didn't expect that the latter part of my life would be doing this. I mean, nobody should really envy what I'm doing. I mean, it, it, this is a sad thing. But if I don't, if I didn't publish this stuff or do these videos, I'm convinced nobody would have figured this thing out, and almost or maybe nobody would have survived it. When you say that this is a, well, can we say the, uh, uh, what's the word I want to use? Some people who say, I would like to know when I'm going to die. Are you essentially saying more or less the same? Basically telling people this is the date, prepare. What is it, What are you trying to accomplish with your research? Well, the, the Torah and the evidence we have of solar cycles, the Gleisberg cycle, we know it's going to happen between September and December 2046. The Torah gives an exact date of October 16, 2046, which is dead center of it. And it's embedded throughout the entire Torah. But how can it how can it be how, is, how can it be the date? Can. How can it be that date when the calendars have changed? They went from the Julian to the matter. Roman. I'll, I'll explain. It's very okay. simple. The message is for us, not for the people two and three thousand years ago. Hmm. It's for us. This is the calendar we use. Got it? Yeah. You understand now? This is the warning for us. That's why Moses could never have understood what this is. He couldn't. It wasn't for him. You have to see, understand why and what happened with Moses and uh, Abraham. That's why I did video series 8, 9, and 10. I'm Video series 10, I'm the first person in 2,600 years that found the real Mount Sinai. And all the altars that Moses mentions in Exodus— You'll see them in that video, and I go through it. You'll see the expedition, and you don't see a picture of the mountain. I don't show it because I, I'm trying to protect it. There's too many people, I'm afraid academics, would probably like to destroy it, and I don't want that to happen. Too many people hate the Jewish religion, hate Jews, and they'll destroy anything they can get their hands on. During the second expedition I went, which is in 2000, uh, 1999, uh, I found the real Abraham's altar buried inside Abra uh, Moses' sacrificial altar. That's how he, he hid and protected Abraham's altar. I found it. I dug it up late at night, uh, about 11.30 at night. We had some Egyptians with us, and one of them got a cold or a sick, and we gave him two Sudafeds. It knocked him out, and I planned this trip on the full moon. I went up on top, and lo and behold— I dug a slit trench into on the right hand side, and I wound up seeing two large stones, one stacked on top of the other, but a little offset back a little bit. And I saw the same flat stones on top that I saw in the first altar that Moses had 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 built at the southwestern part of Mount Sinai, which is just a hill. I found everything, absolutely everything, even where. Um, Aaron's altar was, which you see a picture of, and where the platform where the golden calf was. Everything. So let me go back to 19, correct me if I'm wrong, 1948, after the creation of the state of Israel, they found the Dead Sea Scrolls. Anything yep. from the Dead Sea Scrolls that is giving information as to what happens in the future? I don't know. The Essenes are the ones supposedly who, who wrote them. They had copies of... Well, we're getting into another subject. I don't know if you really want to get into the subject of religion. The, uh, I'll warn you now, I'm a scholar in Roman history also. I know how the New Testament was written. I don't know if you want to go there, but I'll, I'll warn you beforehand. But let's put it this way. They, they, they bottled this stuff up. They, did, they got the manuscripts of what they had to convert into from Greek, what they had to write into Hebrew. What, the Rockefeller Foundation is the one who bought the manuscripts from the Bedouins who found it. They had it for quite a few number of years, and I think that's where they got a bunch of their knowledge about the the religion and stuff like that. And eventually it wound up in the hands of the Israelis. Uh, the way religion works nowadays, I wouldn't say they all work hand and fist, but they, they're all compromised to one's kind of interwoven with another. 
because you know that's what happened over the you know since the church period. Uh, the church had a lot of influence in the Jewish religion after, especially if the Jews wanted to survive and not be slaughtered by the church. So that's it's a complicated story, but I, I wouldn't worry so much about it. I, when for this particular subject, what the Torah actually is is covered basically in the in the video series in the book, Creation of the Hebrew Alphabet. It's 22 views of a waveform. The waveform is a modified square wave that represents how a carbon atom comes into this dimension. The reason why the Torah said the Book of Life is because all life forms we know of are carbon-based life forms. So 22 views of this waveform is the 22 original shape of the letters. That's what it is. And what happened is what Abraham had stumbled on was a deep cave that was a repository of extremely highly advanced technology left from a previous civilization. We don't know how old or how far back in time, but that's what he found. That's why he sold his sister slash wife twice to get the money to buy the hill and the cave. It, th this is a complicated story. This isn't easy to learn. To figure that out, you have to know Moses' 10 code systems. One of them is a word is made up of two or more smaller words. Supposedly the cave that he bought is called Machpelah. You take the word apart and it means a miracle or wondrous place. I said, that doesn't sound like a burial cave to me. <laughs> and it wasn't. And it goes on from there. It, you have to actually either see the video, certainly by the book. It has the whole explanation of his code systems. But if you're going to figure any of this stuff out from the, the, the Torah, the Hebrew scriptures, you have to know that. Otherwise, there's no way. You, you're just bound to the surface story, and you have no idea what's really going on. I have a question regarding... This we're staying with religion just for a second here, but I'm thinking of the eschatolo eschatological term, the three days of darkness. You know that comes from Catholicism. Could these three days of darkness had occurred in the past when the Earth stops, and it would be three days before it turns again? It's actually worse than that. Um, it's not three days after the star novas. What we know from other stars. Uh, like V A thirty A monocretus, it basically is skewed to the ultraviolet. So here you have a tremendous amount of water that's been evaporated. It's in our upper atmosphere and, and the lower atmosphere as thick, thick clouds. And we don't see much. And on top of it, the sun's only producing mostly ultraviolet light. And so I don't know how long it takes for the star to wind up generating this matter shell around it. In other words, the star is not a solid iron core and anything. It is a center modulation point with a lot of information is being directed to a point in time and space. And it creates the matter at that level outside because that's the only place where the energy level is low enough that the atom can finally exist in reality and not demodulate immediately. So you have this dust shell, but you have to have enough of a dust shell to actually produce the infrared light that gives us the heat. Otherwise, you don't have much light. So you don't have anything or very little for maybe one or two solar cycles. So what do you think it's going to look like for 11 to 22 years or longer? Almost no light. That's why that snow does not melt and keeps accumulating, gives you an ice field that's one, two, three, four, or five thousand feet thick. You got the mechanism now? So even even on the side of the earth where the sun is shining, it would still it be matter. darkness. Oh yeah, the sun just basically goes out. Mm -hmm. Or I shouldn't say goes out. It has a center modulation point, but it's so skewed to the ultraviolet until it creates that matter shell. Forget it. The best way is, in one of my videos in, on series one, I go through the uh, V838, and, and it shows, they show it 
when it was stable and all of a sudden a few days or weeks later, it blows. It was a very big storm. That's why we saw it. And it blew its dust shell or matter shell out far enough that we could see this thing. But that's that's what it did. Watching that may be the best indicator of when it starts producing normal light, more skewed to the infrared rather than the ultraviolet. But you have to be an astronomer to do that or really be into the astronomy and have them monitor it all the time and may, may give us a clue. But certainly for one solar cycle, 11 years, forget about the sun. It's going to be dim at best. What about I mean, the Daring Kuyu underground city the, in Cappadocia, a Greek, and in, in, in Turkey? Yeah, you, right. what, what can you tell me about that? Do you think that that civilization knew about this and this is why they planned accordingly? Oh, yeah. There's no question. Remember, last time, you take a globe, which I have one right here. The Earth rotated the other direction, the other direction and the water went from east to west. So if you look at where it is in Turkey and Greece, Greece would have had the Black Sea, but the Black Sea is pretty small. And the Indian Ocean, the Arabian Sea, is really south of it. So it would have passed them, and they wouldn't have gotten any, any flooding. So they would have been okay in the caves that they built because there wouldn't have been any water or very little water entering it other than when it started raining and snowing. I'm sure they had some way of blocking up the doors. That's one way, one thing I've been working with some mechanical and civil engineers of to help people what kind of door system to build so they'd survive this thing. The door system is very, very important if you're in a cave or even in a pyramid because the pressures it has to take, it, it depends on how far away you are from the ocean and what your elevation is and how deep the water will be when it passes over you. So the door is the key part, how many pounds per square inch it has to be able to take. So that's kind of the, the next stage for the foundation is to help people physically with one, where to go, what hill or mountain ranges you should go to. And it's not going to be in the United States, except you want to do southern Florida and, and maybe northern Mexico or the southern tip of Texas. But you want to be as close as you can to the equator uh, within 15 degrees north or south of it. So uh, that's where the, the, the snow and the ice is going to melt first. We're going to assume that the ocean water in the equator is going to be still warm enough that and when it does start snowing, it's going to melt a lot of that snow and moderate the cold. And it won't do it forever because with no sunlight, it's not going to warm up the ocean. But some of these things, I shouldn't have to do all of them. Noah should be doing their part and NASA should be doing their part. But I don't even know if they were given the job to figure it out. Or if they don't do or, the, the whole mechanism. They probably were never even told what to figure out. Or maybe they're just there to deceive us. I hate to say it. I, I don't know. I like to think that that good people are there that would like to figure it out. But if they're not told, they, they're they not going to do it if they're not told. Remember, they, they're in a bureaucracy. They're given orders to do something. And that's it. Well, of course. But then the question is, what can we expect as, as a civilization when this event occurs? And obviously, if it happened in the past, as you say, there were survivors, unless we were placed here after. What do we expect as a, as a civilization when this event occurs now? Good question. I don't know how to answer it. Um, all I can, all I'm trying to do is give people a fighting chance. To be forewarned is to be forearmed, as you know. And the, the foundation, the Diehl Foundation, is a nonprofit science foundation. And at some point, if I get enough money, I'm going to hire uh, another geologist, and then we have to contact geologists in Brazil, Venezuela, maybe uh, Colombia, uh, every place around the equator in Africa, the same place there. I'm already in contact with a few people in Australia, but you know where to go, where can people go, and what to build and how to build it. Then the next stage would be what to take with you. I envision this stuff, cave systems, like the cave system in Turkey, I think they estimate it holds about two or 3,000 people. It's a lot of people. I envision like a group of people, let's say several hundred, two, three, four hundred, five hundred, 
pitching in and being part of a cave system, they have to work together. The best is if they formed a corporation and everybody had one vote, one, one share. And they have to have a mix of people that be able to help them, both doctors and engineers, mechanics, you know. But this is probably too soon now. I mean, we still have over 25 years before this thing happens. It's not going to happen sooner. If people scary about that. It's going to be five years. I've heard some somebody say that. It, it's not going to. It's, we're going to have a sunspot maximum. I don't know how bad it's going to be. And we'll have one one more after that. But the one after that is is D-Day as far as we're concerned. Let's stay with Darren Cuyo for a second. It's actually 20,000 people, 18, 18 different levels. And it was supposedly established around the 7th or 8th century BCE. So those people back then did not have the technology that we have today. Obviously, they had some knowledge to be forewarned to create these massive places to do it. Why does it seem that these people in the past, before the common era, before Christ, had more ability to 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 endure this than we do today? <clears throat> I'll tell you what's interesting from Plato. Solon was talking to the priests in in Egypt, and the Egyptians told him that there was a, a marvelous people, advanced people, that came from that Greek area, which is probably where the caves are you're talking about, that survived the last cataclysm, and they eventually populated where they're in the Nile Delta area, and they survived it. And that was it. So the Egyptians are saying people did survive there, advanced people. And that's who we are probably descended from, the people who did survive it. The only way you could, could do this. I mean, this is not easy for the survivors or the people who attempt to survive this thing. It's um, not easy. This is not a, a cakewalk at all. But isn't it interesting that we're told that Daring Kuyu was built to protect the population from invading forces? And not once do you see anywhere where it says to <laughs> circumvent the cataclysm. Actually, you're partially wrong on that one. <laughs> there are some laws that came from the executive orders, and they do in fact say natural disasters. In fact, I think I can find it here for you. And so you're not exactly correct. Remember, I read a lot of this stuff. <laughs> oh, where is it? They, in one of the laws, they actually define, uh, I think it was that Thomas, uh, um, here it is. Oh, by the way, uh, the, the law, Robert T. Stanford Disaster Relief Act of, of 1988, um, you remember the movie Armageddon with Bruce Willis? Of course. Okay. Where a comet hits the earth and when it hit the earth. Okay. A meteor. Not a comet. It was a comet. They gave Bruce Willis's uh, part's name. The name of him was Harry Stanford. Yep. It's the same name as the Disaster Relief Act. <laughs> Is that right? So the writer of the movie knew something about that Disaster Relief Act and maybe what's going on. By the way, you'll remember that movie, if you watch the credits, got help from NASA, the military, the federal government help up, down, and sideways. What's coming with all those movies, man was to keep be kept in the dark. No one's going to know shit. And they were going to save someone. And they're going to have this crew go save them. Like interesting. That. Interesting you say that because I remember that 1997 when he came out. And during that time, a few movies, I guess, because we were approaching the, the, the new the new millennium, uh, a new century close to 2012. But 1997, we had that. We also had Deep Impact. Yeah, oh. that was 1998. Armageddon is 1996. And we had Deep Impact 1998. I want to mention in the next video. Uh, oh, yeah, I had listed a bunch of them. Knowing was another. Uh, that was, again, the sun flaring up right. with uh, Nicolas Cage. Yep. Uh, I actually had the goal to use my name in, in there, too. Uh, one of the characters' name was Douglas. Uh, 2012 was 2009. 
And that was interesting because it showed the government went to billionaires and <laughs> your membership for saving your ass was basically give us a billion dollars or more. If you want, every member is going to be a billion dollars and they built the stuff. Yes. And where did they go? And the submarines, they went to China, exactly. Up in the mountains, they were building uh, these, these ships. And it was a great movie. It really was. Um, the other one, the last one is called Greenland. And I watched it. I haven't this seen that one. It was a, a meteor again hitting, of course, it hit Europe. They love hitting uh, Paris for some reason. <laughs> yes. And, and they went up to Greenland to supposedly get saved. So, so, again, about these cities, they're in Kuyo, I keep saying that, but they have over 200 underground, underground cities. And obviously, this was public during that time. But right now, it seems like you mentioned fascism, you mentioned feudalism, communism. What is the common denominator? It's just all the power and resources on the hands of a few. So, top down rule. Exactly. To the top. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, that's what they want. And that's what the army guy is admitting that this is what he thinks is going on. What you're seeing is that what he said earlier is they wanted to have a smaller population, would be a more controllable or more nimble population. They want to get rid of what, they, what Kissinger called the useless, the eaters. useless eaters. I mean, and you know, the useless users are the ones who were helping with this Dominion software to steal the election. There was Correct. no question about it. Right. This, and what's going to happen? They're basically signing their death warrant. That's what's happened. They're being used, just like a lot of biomedical you know, people in the industry have been disappeared or killed under mysterious circumstances. All of a sudden, what do we get? COVID-19 and the rest of them. But... Again, what can we expect if this were to happen now? Well, all those movies, nobody knows anything until it almost happens. I'm giving you 25 years. The only, the only hope there is, is one, that the government or military realizes they made a horribly expensive mistake. And they should try to make deals with, you know, certainly for us in the Americas, it's going to either northern Brazil or southern Venezuela, the hills and the mountains and stuff like that, and, and building shelters there and pyramids. The only way to, to survive this thing. And, and the next thing you have to also think about, it's nice to be near an area where the continental shelf isn't that long that you can be able to get to the ocean to go fishing for protein. That's the other thing you got to think about. Because remember, the, the ocean level, after this event happens, it's going to be, 400 to maybe 450, maybe even deeper down. So look at the elevation of the bithmetric maps, and you can tell where, you know, like, for instance, in Australia, <clears throat> some of the guys were saying, where's a safe place to go? And I said, well, northern or northeastern Australia and those mountain ranges may be a good place. But the problem is after the event happens, you could literally walk from northern Australia to New Guinea. I'm not kidding. Because it's the shelf there is so shallow, they can go, they can walk it. Isn't that what happened? A lot of these civilizations around the world, probably the Strait probably. of Bering and, and the rest of them, and that's what they use. What about the Yonaguni? Uh, uh, what is it? The pyramids in Yonaguni in, in Japan that are underwater. Could this have I happened at about other time? Yeah. How many feet down is it? And there's a city that they found with well, the northeast of Cuba. That's even further down. So God knows how old that right. thing is. But listen, you, you've got the idea. The physical evidence is all around us. You know, Machu, Machu Picchu, how come all these huge, monstrous buildings were made 10, 11,000 feet up, 12,000 feet up? Because it's simple. Look at the body of water just west of them. And they knew it was coming towards them. So they built as high as they can so they didn't get flooded. And what did they use? The biggest rocks they could find possibly work. So they didn't get washed away. But this Yonaguni part, 26 meters, is when the where the monuments are. Do you think that at one point in our history, there were certain parts of our world that were above the surface, and when the reversal happened, other parts became, you know, what happened there? They became undersea and, they, and buried? I, I know what you're getting at. Yeah, if you, I mentioned in, in also Series 4 that... The reason why most of the mountain ranges have a north-south orientation is because when the Earth stops its rotation, 
the direction of force for the crust of the earth, which is swimming on a heated up sea of magma below them, is that force is perpendicular to the direction of how these mountains are growing. So you have a seduction fault that pushes it down, that pushes the other star, the earth up, you have a mountain range. So in some places it's gonna some places will sink down and some places will pop up. Exactly. You can see it in some cliffs. At hard rock cliffs where if if there's no if the amount of erosion is the same above as below that means that thing rose in one shot so the, the woolly mammoth in siberia that became frozen suddenly is this what you expect oh uh, yeah you know who gets it the europeans i was able to figure out that's also in in 5g part 5g that i know what side of the earth nova last time where it was nova last time and you're able to actually figure out by how often the earth's magnetic field moves which looks like it's 1508 years so it went from originally from someplace over china over japan that that longitude i, I go into the number uh in the video i can't remember it now and so you go I think it's counterclockwise, and you could figure out every 1,508 years where you wind up with, and magically you wind up with over Nova Zimbla in that neighborhood, which is a longitude running through Moscow, Russia, uh, Saudi Arabia, Eastern Africa, Iran, that kind of stuff. Now, that side of the earth will be smack dab center 12 noon when the sun novas give or take 10 degrees east or west uh, 17 to 18 hours later the dust shell hits us and that will be uh, a longitude running from the date line of 180 degrees to further west maybe another 20 degrees someplace in there 30 degrees maybe in there, the dust shell will hit. That means the amount of atmosphere on that side will be extremely low when the dust shell hit us. We don't know how deep this dust shell is from the sun. It may be 50,000 miles, it may be 20,000 miles, it may be 100 or 200,000 miles. We just don't know. When it hits us, that's what's going to happen there. Exactly on the other side of the Earth is Europe and so what happens is you have it's Boyle's law if you have one side of the earth with extremely low atmospheric pressure the exact other side of the earth uh the atmosphere is normal but then it starts expanding rapidly to fill up the extremely low pressure hence you have extremely strong winds wrapping around the earth and many mythologies talk about extremely strong winds blowing things down and everything else like that so all that evaporated moisture from when the sun nova on their side of the earth then becomes immediately frozen or or the 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 moisture in the atmosphere condenses immediately becomes clouds instantly and it starts snowing and snowing and snowing and there's going to be Atlantic Ocean still on the surface of Europe because it's going to go in, a, in an easterly direction. And that may, when this thing happens, it may be, you may have 40 or 50 feet, you may have 100 feet of, of ocean water there, maybe more. And it's going to freeze solid, just like that wave I showed that was found near the French outpost in Antarctica, which is south and west of Australia, which is... That was the side of the earth that got got that instant ice age. That's why you saw the fast frozen mammoths and other animals. They were on the backside when the dust shell hit the Americas, like running, a, a lawsuit running through like Brazil. By the way, we didn't talk about the Antarctic Treaty. Why do you think the real reason for that is? Because that's the only place in the world where corporations haven't been able to go and explore and, and exploit uh unknown since we really don't 
they're, they're looking for, they've been doing core samples mostly to find out what, and they find layers that have a lot of the glass beads are dirt, the dark layers. That's the glass beads and stuff like that, meteor, what they call a meteor, but they're really not. It's just the stuff thrown out by the sun. And uh, I think it more intrigued them. They, they're there to study it because it's kind of a, a pristine environment, not damaged by rain, flood, mankind. So it's like going to the moon, untouched. They go there and they can study it and see what happened. You said something and, that caught my attention, by the way. You think the 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 pyramids have something to do with with this at all? Well, yeah. If you're if you're getting core samples from Antarctica, you're trying to find out one how old the ice is, and when you start seeing the bands and you start taking the dark areas apart and you see what's in them, you see the glass beads, the same stuff they find on the moon, and in right at the magnetic reversal layers here on the Earth, then you realize you got a problem. You really do have a problem. No, I mentioned that pyramids, that the all the pyramids around the world, do you think yeah. they could have been used to house living beings during the times of the cataclysms? Oh, yeah, there's no question about it. In fact, there was over, I, I've seen one place, 100,000 earthen pyramids found in northern Iran, and the German mythology is that they came from there, and after... After the reversal, after the Ice Age, or when the ice melted from where they came from, namely Northern Europe, Northern Europe, they went back. They went back to Northern Europe. So they knew something, and they went back there. Someone told them worldwide to build pyramids. They found in China. They found all over the world. Why that shape? Because that's the shape. That's the only way above ground you're going to be able to survive this thing. When you have a wave rushing over, you're at two, three, or 400 miles an hour, and it could be hundreds of feet to 1,000 feet or more high. You need a shape. You can't have a perpendicular shape. The water will knock it over. But the pyramid shape is, is the perfect shape. To withstand it. You got it. You see, you're, you're, opening, right. you're opening minds now. So we have just a couple of minutes left. We all remember Donald Rumsfeld at September 10th, 2001, before Congress saying that the Pentagon had lost $2.3 trillion. Do you think that this money went into these caves and bunkers? I'd say that's petty cash. Uh, yeah, uh, Rumsfeld, I can't remember what year he was in. I think he was in the Reagan administration. Reagan first so, and then with uh, Bush Jr. Yeah, he, he basically was, you know, I'm sure a congressman must have asked the questions, and it's probably you could double it. And it was probably money for use for the Corps of Engineers to build and b buy and build out some of these cave systems and and build more cave systems. And, and I think that's what is what was going on there. Uh, now it's supposedly twenty one trillion, and uh, it was involved HUD and um, I don't think Homeland Security all that much. But uh, FEMA definitely took over a lot of the, those functions. Yeah, according to Catherine Austin Fitz. I, I don't know who that is, but FEMA basically uh, was involved, is involved in also housing this stuff. And that's not included in, in, in uh, uh, Trump's executive order that uh, FEMA and, and uh, Homeland Security was not included, as well as uh, HUD. They stood out like sore thumbs, uh, that rural development. And he actually treated the executive order like it's going to help the farmers in rural communities rather than a cover story. <laughs> that one led to me, but maybe they never told him about the cave systems and why they were being built. I mean, it doesn't make it. It's possible, but because every other president, as far as I could tell, did know about it. And you mean talk, you're talking about Trump? Talking about Trump not knowing. What about Agenda 21 and 2030? Any any correlation I, here? I only read a brief summary of it, so I can't really say okay. for sure. Other than it's supposedly an efficient farming and and uh, economic system to streamline it and 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 a centralized control. They love centralized controls. Bureaucracy has, is going to turn out to be the worst enemy of the, of the people, the bureaucracy itself. 
What about the communication you've had with government? Did, did you send letters? And if, if so, did they acknowledge no, the your only, letters? When, when I was, the reason I'm doing all these videos is I had to present the entire theory, prove that I was actually Mount Sinai, prove why the Hebrew effort was wrong, prove what was really going on here. And, and all the evidence I could muster and had on the causes of the Ice Age and polar reversals and the theory. When I got done, the only letter I wrote, registered letter, which included three of my books, was to the president, vice president, um, head of national security, uh, and uh, Joint Chiefs of Staff, Secretary of Defense, and head of Army Intelligence, and also the head of the FBI. Ironically, the funny part, the FBI guy didn't get his letter for over 25 days. It's a registered letter. It's locked up in a... And that's when the post office said they finally picked it up. Is that hilarious or what? What do you think? It landed in some other people's desks before the final no. destination? The post office said... They didn't get it till I think it was August, was it September second, fourth, something ridiculous. I mean, just, why so long to get a letter, a registered letter to the FBI? It's crazy. One last question before you give us your closing remarks, or hopefully an uplifting latter part of the of the interview. But a very important question for last: Why are we being lied to? They're afraid of losing control of the population if they knew the truth. Also, there's too much to fix. Look how much videos I have to basically fix about 3,500 years of history. And the worst part is the science stuff. Are you gonna tell a nuclear physicist that most of what he was taught in school was wrong, his degree isn't worth the paper it's printed on? How do you do that? These people are proud and they're smart. They were just taught the wrong stuff. Some of them were smart enough to realize something's wrong, but they didn't adventure beyond the thought, if you know what I mean. They didn't develop it and say, why is it wrong? Why are we seeing some of these alleged subatomic particles and we still can't connect them up with the spectral line frequencies of the elements that we know exist? What's going on? They didn't do that. That's why it's so pr easy to prove them wrong. So tell me now, one well, last part, last nugget of wisdom. What can you tell the people to prepare because they will not get this information from our Anyone? Google government? Um, tell as many people as you can. Uh, if you leave a comment, I really need a email address. Send me an email address to either info at dieholefoundation.com or research at dieholefoundation.com. If you have a question, uh, one of the videos I did, actually, I took a, a bunch of questions from people. I asked for opinions or, or comments, and I answered them in a video. And I might do it for more than for the other theory, um, series also, not just for series four. But if you want, if, if your children or grandchildren have any hope of surviving this thing, is basically first understand what I've been presenting. Understand some of the theory, understand what happens during the polar reversal and cataclysm, so you understand it, its vastness and why so few people survived it. And then you, you basically have to say, okay, some people have written to me, I'm just going to sit back in my easy chair with a whole bunch of liquor and I'm going to drink myself silly and wait till the wave comes. I'm not kidding. Or something like that. I get that for a lot of people. And I don't blame Like them. in the movies, right? Oh, I uh, listen. People have to make a decision. I'm just trying to save the young people that, uh, so they have a chance to survive this thing. Eventually, government will come around. The government has not formally contacted me at all. If they did, I probably would not have put their stuff in a video. I wouldn't have because I have to work with them. You have to understand, this is a very big project to do this thing. To, you can't do it alone. You have to do it with a group of people. The federal government has the means to do it, but they've been building these things in the wrong place. As DARPA has now proven that I'm, I'm right, they cannot get these people out. 
They probably got a lot of dead people in there. And they have no guarantee that a nuclear reactor inside these things are going to last for even more than 50 years. Things break. Mechanical things break down. Motors break down. You have to replace the armatures in them, the brushes. So you see my point. I, I see it, your point, but I also – do it. I also, also, if I'm asking people to go to, to Brazil and stuff like that, you need permission from the Brazilian government to build something, to enter the country and do this. You have to have legal rights so you can defend your rights if you buy land to build a cave system. I also see, Doug, that the government has information on Tesla's creations that are not made public, and they could be using that technology for themselves. But one last thing that just occurred to me before I let you go, if the government came to you, Doug, I said, Mr. Voigt, vote, keep your mouth shut, don't tell anybody else, and we'll give you safe harbor. What would you answer to that? Well, it's too late for that. I know more than they do, and it's all out <laughs> in the videos. It doesn't matter anymore. But how many people are going to watch my stuff? I'll never get on, on any of the major broadcast networks because I don't have a PhD in these things, and they won't put you on. They have gatekeepers. Right. But you understand, the letter I sent the government – is of a different nature. It's it's a different way of doing something. And that's the people who got the letter, certainly the Defense Department understood that thoroughly. So, but I'm not too sure I really want to deal with the Biden administration since I know what he did. Well, the people behind him did. So I'm very reluctant. I don't want any of this stuff to wind up in the hands of the Chinese. And it will. It obviously would immediately. Oh, yeah. Bought and paid for. Yeah. I'm, I'm an open book. As you can tell, pe many people thank me for doing the videos and giving so much free information out. I consider these classes. Like you go to a college, they're unedited. I don't edit anything. It's like you went to a class and the professor talks, makes mistakes, whatever. That's it. You got it. It's it's an endless subject. The The reason that the thing about the uh, creation of the Hebrew alphabet is so important. And I sell a lot of those books. Mm -hmm. Actually, I rather I sell it with God's Air Judgment and Theory of Multidimensional Reality. Those three books are the most common ones I sell in groups. And it just, they buy all of them at that, that time. And it's because it proves we're dealing with an extremely highly advanced previous civilization. And they had the same philosophy of the universe that I developed. Otherwise, I could never have figured out what they were doing. You should see that series. I'm not kidding. It's series two. Uh, by the way, that book, Creation of the Hebrew Alphabet, was indexed by the Library of Congress, Q, with 86.889, which is quantum computing. You never saw that before. A book on the Hebrew alphabet is indexed as quantum computing. Now you understand who's indexing my books. <laughs> It's the CIA. That's how I do it. How can people buy, how can people read your books, buy your books, uh, watch your videos? How can they do that? Amazon. They're all on Amazon. Uh, except Reality Revealed is only on a CD. Reality Revealed is out of print and it goes for between $700 to $1,400. Someone sold that book for $85,000 because it had my signature in it. Did he sell it? I think he, I don't know, it didn't, it, it was on there for a couple of weeks and then it disappeared, so I guess he sold it. Wow. Why are you not publishing again? Republishing it. I had, I had the videos to do. I got to, I'm going to do, after I get done with it tonight, tomorrow morning, I'm going to do the next video, which is going to go up. I mean, this part 5H. So, I mean, that's just the way it is. It's just, there's so much time in a day. That's it. I mean. I'm only one person. It's, it's an endless subject. The, the reason that the thing about the uh, creation of the Hebrew alphabet is so important, and I sell a lot of those books. Mm -hmm. Actually, I'd rather I sell it with God's Air Judgment and Theory of Multidimensional Reality. Those three books are the most common ones I sell in groups. And it just They buy all of them at that, that time. And it's because it proves we're dealing with an extremely highly advanced previous civilization. And they had the same philosophy of the universe that I developed. Otherwise, I could never have figured out what they were doing. You should see that series. I'm not kidding. It's series two. Uh, by the way, that book, 
creation of the Hebrew alphabet was indexed by the Library of Congress, Q, with 86.889, which is quantum computing. You never saw that before. A book on the Hebrew alphabet is indexed as quantum computing. Now you understand who's indexing my books. <laughs> it's the CIA. Well, I have to say, I know how old you are, but you sound much, much younger. You're a erudite when you speak very eloquently. And I want to thank you for your work. And I hope that we can do this again. And please keep us posted with any new information that comes out. You are now in my Rolodex. Thank you so much for being part of the program and for doing what you do. Thank you. I'll put you on my mailing list. Thank you. Have a good night. Take care. You too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. And that was Douglas Vote with the secrets that the powers that want to be will never share with you. As always, I want to thank you, very dust member, for paving a truth journey another week. And tonight, I'll leave you with this. Nothing is impossible. The word itself says, I'm possible. Thanks for listening. I'm Mel Hustlerick. Until next week, be well. <laughs>